EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and is part of the MasterCard Foundation Young Africa Works Programming. Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of EdTech Mondays Africa. My name is Joy Doreen Bira and in this edition we are talking about the emerging technologies in EdTech. And well, what better way to kick off our discussion than with a conversation on data. Big data is making waves across the education ecosystem. And if you did notice the 2023 GEM report that was focused on technology does speak a lot to data students. Allow me introduce our guests to us. My name is Luke Stannard. I'm a senior education advisor at Save the Children, and I work to support our teams and governments across different parts of the world, including particularly East Africa, uh, around education technology and teacher professional development. My name is Chinedu Anaradu. I'm the communication specialist at the Association for the Development of Education in Africa, ADEA. ADEA is hosted by the African Development Bank Group, a, a special project, and our role is to support education policies across our member countries, all 55 countries in Africa. My name is Joshua Chidu. I had um, business development with MCN Chinosis, looking at uh, expanding Chinosis in different African markets. So basically what Chinosis does is it helps with uh, telco data monetization to help uh, critical sectors like education, like banking, uh, FMCG and other tech uh, space um, in Africa. My name is Shikun Bugwa. I work for an organization called Brink, where we use behavioral innovation to solve sticky problems, education being more of the work that we do. I'm the country lead for our EdTech Hub program which is essentially mandated to generate evidence and then use that evidence to help decision makers understand how to implement technology meaningfully in education. Fantastic. And of course, the experts are with us in the studio. And speaking of emerging technologies in education, you know, the 2023 GEM report on technology in education does speak about the use of technology in education and also around the world through the lens of evidence, of quality, scalability, sustainability. But we can't talk about these four elements without speaking about data or big data for that matter. And this report did argue that education systems should always ensure that learners' interests are placed at the center and that digital technologies are used to support an education based on human interaction rather than aiming at substituting it. Now, big data provides an opportunity to educational institutions to use their IT resources strategically. But let's take it from the start. What exactly is big data and how can it be conceptualized in our education systems? Um, Chinedu, do you want to give us a go? Big data is basically the data that we are interested in. Uh, but at this point in time, in very large uh, sets, it could be structured. It could be unstructured, it could be semi-structured. They are huge. Um, it comes in from the different educational activities that are happening. Um, there's different varieties. There are different types of information, you know, uh, audio, sensors, videos, day-to-day uh, -day activities that underpin teacher and learning, uh, basically aggregated together, but such in which um, existing data assessment, data analysis systems cannot really handle um, they are also could they could also be complex. Um, you know, such an elaborate um, collection of information that is not exactly easy to distill, um, extrapolate, and analyze, so that you then require you know massive data analysis systems to be able to interpret them. In terms of what it basically looks like for education, I think that we are looking at um, additional information to support our ability to deliver teaching and learning. Uh, you're looking at uh, at information on how to improve personalized le personalized learning, uh, predictive analytics in terms of how pupils are learning, students that are at risk, um, how conflict and social dimensions or social activities are impacting the quality of information. You know, you are looking at information on a continuous assessment, evaluating the student or pupil performance, or even teacher performance, or even school administration performance. Big data is also uh, positioned properly to help us automate a number of things, you know, administrative processes, uh, what happens between the point a child enrolls for, you know, mm -hmm. the enrolls in any uh, environment to the point where he graduates. Uh, the goal is how can pupils also collaborate and how can you deliver better 
you know, teaching and learning in a manner that focuses exactly on ensuring that you're teaching uh, pupils at their learning level, you know. So there's a ton of things we can do with big data, but it then has to start from, first of all, conceptualizing it, um, understanding what information it, it carries, analyzing it properly, and then picking out exactly what speaks to the different needs of any specific education system. With that now, we can almost quite see how it is being conceptualized. But look, I just want to hear from you in terms of the conceptualization of big data in education. Is there unique ways that we are seeing this emerging, especially from the work that you're doing with Save the Children? I don't think necessarily big data is new in education, just the means by which we go about analyzing it. And a better understanding of some of the indicators of social inequality, for example, allow us to look at the data in a more perhaps useful way. We've been doing large school, uh, countries all over the world have been in large school annual censuses in terms of EMIS for you know decades. And so what big data allows us is potentially to, to move that closer to the school. So we have higher frequency indicators coming into it, which in, um, allows us to better understand a whole range of different areas. Um, we briefly just discussed it, but talking about um, learning outcomes is a, a reasonably high, you know, at the moment is a reasonably high frequency indicator. We, we, it can be quite a difficult thing to assess and so forth. But um, some of the work that Save the Children, obviously always working in partnership with government to do, has really helped to governments to conceptualize and identify those who are the most marginalized or perhaps not engaging with education in the way that uh, you might want. And, and so for organizations with a mandate around child rights and so forth, data offers a huge opportunity to encourage governments to be more accountable in their education systems, but also for them to understand what ones of their students are falling furthest behind. And I think if we can engage with data more proactively and, and make sure that we have the right staffing levels across um, government departments, um, it's, it's a critical component to doing education well. And we're seeing some really good practice. Great, um, Shiko. If you, if you, if you, if I might come to you, um, do you think that the Africa education landscape is equipped to handle big data, or do you think that there is a sense of lack of data? Big data is not new. It's just mm -hmm. the way we are collecting it and we're storing it is different. But I think I would roll it back to why. Why? Why do we want big data? What is it that we want our education systems to look like? Are we talking about quality? Are we talking about equity? As Luke said. And even at equity, we don't really want to just know who are being left further behind. Mm -hmm. The ones who are passing with like 70, 80%, why are they passing with 70, 80? What's the other 10%? Because what's, what's happening is we're passing children through the education system, but when they get into industry, they have gaps. And I think it's because we didn't focus on the 80%, what was the 20% gap. So what do we want to use this data for? I think if we look at it that way, then we are equipped. I know that countries like Kenya are already thinking of digital assessment or e-assessment in the formative stage because then it allows you to be able to have data to understand where Shiko is before she reaches the summative assessment and there's nothing you can do for her because she's left the education system. So I think I would begin with what's our very clear why. Mm -hmm. Once you define the why, then the how becomes pretty easy to do because then, as Luke said, you have organizations such as Save the Children, EdTech Hub, um, a day who are willing to come on board and assist you with the technicalities of it. But as government, the government needs to hold the vision of why do we want big data to work for us? I think uh, it's also important for us to pretty much frame out the benefits of big data in education in Africa. Uh, Joshua, I want to hear your thoughts on this one as well. Um, the benefits of big data in education, because you've done work with telecoms or telcos across Africa. And we also want to understand how they're able to aggregate this uh, data and transform it into meaningful uh, data for institutions to use in Africa. You want to take us through that? One of the core foundations at which most new technologies are built today is actually based on uh, connectivity infrastructure of these telcos, right? Um, and I think one of the key roles Telco play in this particular space uh, would be providing connectivity to uh, serve as the base or the foundation at which uh, 
your big data infrastructure, your artificial intelligence infrastructure, and then lay up, upon, right? Um, I, I think the critical role to help us will play in this instance would be providing connectivity um, infrastructure in schools, in universities, in tertiary institutions, where uh, so, uh, software solutions, where big data solutions can then ride upon. So we've seen a lot of that uh, in Nigeria. Uh, we've seen a lot of that in Cameroon. Uh, there was this um, technology part I was discussing with last week who are who probably just got a contract to, you know, digitize most uh, public institutions in Cameroon, right? Uh, on top of that, obviously, NTN will be providing connectivity for that. But uh, the good thing about that is he's able to aggregate all of these uh, institutions, data records, score records from these universities and aggregate them on a platform, which is actually big data, just like uh, uh, just, just, just like as it was defined then. The next step would then be offering uh, probably an AI solution using chatbots, using uh, USSD. You know, your student can you know make inquiries about um, classes, about content, about uh, a personal assessment when it comes to education. So I think critically, what the, the space telco play would be to provide that connectivity infrastructure at which universities, schools, edtech. Um, uh, companies can build their big data solution, their artificial intelligence solution upon. And and when you look at the benefits of uh, data, just like you put them, uh, you know, we, we also tend to maybe not pay much attention to the drawbacks uh, of big data. And I think, look, this is something that, that we need to take into consideration given the dynamic factors that we work with in Africa and also uh, the different fragmentations that, that we currently have, um, maybe you could just take us into uh, some of those drawbacks and what are some of the learnings we can take out of them? So one of the biggest ones is data protection. Have you got the relevant systems in place um, and the supports in place? A lot of countries do have that, but making sure that that's actually done in practice when you're collecting large amounts of quite uh, of, you know, children are um, protected by specific rights and so forth and making sure that their data is protected and utilised uh, effectively and, and safely is really important. And, and though governments often have um, good policies around this, it's making sure that's that's done in practice. Um, so the data protection piece is important. Aside from that, there's a whole range of areas where they, it can cause problems. If it's not uh, systematically kept, then you could look at communities potentially not being represented in the data. That gives you uh, a data set that doesn't give you a full picture, or as full a picture as you want, uh, which means that essentially important decisions around, say, government spending on parts of education are representing the full um, communities that, that they're meant to serve. So it's really important to make sure that data collection is, is uh, well-funded and well-resourced. And then also, sometimes um, data doesn't tell you everything. Uh, you need to follow up. You need to not over rely on quantitative data. You've got qualitative feedback that's also critical. And as we all know, when things get put in graphs, they do tend to become facts. And so we need to make sure that we have the systems in place to uh, triangulate, follow up, better understand some of the nuances as to perhaps why people aren't engaging or what some of the data shows us. So they're just some very brief um, issues, but all of them can be addressed and have been addressed in different ways and they shouldn't be a barrier to us engaging with them they're just some warnings that are about uh from different uses of large data and big data and it's it's something we're we're very equipped uh, and, and governments are very equipped to address interesting learnings there uh shiko do you want to add to yes. what Luke has said yes please i think how we collect the data is also really critical mm -hmm. because we're relying on the teachers and everybody at the school level so how do we make sure that the way we are collecting the data is not biased, the data is clean, so that by the time we're aggregating it at a national level, we have a true picture of all of the areas. I think even with NEMIS, which we run in Kenya, we've had problems with authenticity oftentimes because right. we want the data to favor our particular situation. So how do we also change the mindset of the people that we are relying on to collect this data 
so that they understand the importance of it being accurate. I think that's that's a key point that the government needs to think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe, uh, Chinedu, you can take us on this one, on the benefits of big data in education. It's been contextualized properly, and that is to say that a, a lot of it is now already happening. Uh, some of this information are being collected and used um, clearly, but then it could be in silos, um, not to the size and scale that we could call big data. However, we are looking at data sets and information that could help us improve access to education, targeting out of school children, um, ensuring that we are uh, you know, removing the barriers to education and learning, especially for pupils or for learners who live in remote areas, uh, but also ensure that we can incre- increase access to education policies for all you know, learners. Um, student targeting is also another very important benefit in the sense that Analytics can then start looking at specific needs of individual learners, um, being able to uh, implement what we call teaching at the right level, which is basically ensuring that we can look at a learner, not based on the grade or class or grade where he is, but at his learning capacity, his learning skill, his learning speed, and basically grouping pupils who are within the same category together in order to enhance or improve delivery. There's also the aspect of new resource allocation, uh, after there, we had a conversation with um, um, an EdTech um, a fellow uh, called Edutams, and it was interesting to understand exactly how information and data was used to improve resourcing uh, school materials to specific um, you know, academic institutions um, in, in, a, in a state in Nigeria. We are looking at increased accountability. I think it was Luke who mentioned about how data could help government become more accountable. Uh, that's also speaking to our ability to understand exactly how much we've spent, what's been spent on, where are the investments going, uh, what are they are trying to address, and if the results of those investments are actually showing up, you know, to ensure that we are achieving our goals. Um, you know, there are then issues around better recruitment of teachers, uh, enhancing employability of and, you know, improving operational efficiencies for school administrators. And speaking of EduTerms, let's take a look at this integrated cloud-based solution that is helping to automate and digitize education processes in Nigeria's Ogun state. My name is Dr. Adimola Adinobi, and I'm the founder and CEO of EduTerms. Uh, for us at EduTerms, our major focus is building a school solution that digitizes their processes and enhances their operations. When we started at times and we're working, well, one big issue that we have was we needed to scale up our cloud server. So funding was restricting the cloud server subscription that we will do. My experience with the portal started from when I applied for admission into the school year and I was able to do my screening and get my post TME updates through the portal. I proceeded with payments, paying for acceptance fee, registration fee and school fees. All these were done online, really easy to use and I got my metric number almost immediately after paying my school fees. In the aspect of admission, uh, as the dean, I had to approve a number of things for students. But because EduTams is there, I don't have to attend them physically. Everything is online, which makes it easy for me. Um, I also take my classes online because we have the platform for that. My lectures are taken online. The, the MasterCard program has been a significant one that we have participated. And that has exposed us working with a number of teams. I know we have the people's team, we work with product team, we work with the talent team, we work with the investment team, we work with the finance team. All of these are critical components that has enhanced our operations and also exposed us to how to build a better tech company. So what the board does is that we vet results. Before Edutam came, we were doing it manually, and it was extremely tedious. With EduTams, students' results are uploaded from the departments. We do the vetting to know, okay, who is having problem, who is not having problem, who is um, to graduate, who is not to graduate, and that has made it a lot, a lot easier. With the help of our course advisors, we were able to apply for courses online. I mean, it was very easy for us to add courses, remove courses based on our needs. We were also able to do our e-tests 
using the portal. I've never experienced any issue during my e-test courses and we also get the result of our e-test almost immediately. Payment of fees has become a lot easier and has also been able to block off uh, these doubts and um, these disgruntled elements coming with the intention of duping and uh, defrauding people. So you don't have to, you don't have to give your money to anybody to pay your fees. You can just go online, access the portal, and get it paid. From all of us at Edu Times, we want to say a very big thank you for the Mastercard Foundation for the opportunity to participate in this acceleration program. You've actually impacted a startup company that is impacting the lives of over 1.5 million learners in Nigeria and Africa. When we talk about the education sector in Africa and the kind of challenges that we're looking at and the kind of challenges that you've spoken about, but also some of the learnings, um, they are certain decisions that we can make that are specific to transforming our education. And I want to hear from us, um, Joshua, especially from the innovative side, how can big data support data-driven education policies? Because what we currently see, in fact, uh, over the last five years, I think there has been different calls for a change in our curriculum, a change in uh, you know aligning certain policies to suit the adoption of technology in our education systems. But can we be specific? Can we be a little specific? kind of data-driven policies that we can get out of big data? So if you look at the way some of our education curriculum is actually structured today, right, um, you would see that most of the curriculum will consist of um, subjects or topics that are decades old and are, are taking this new world of technology, um, this new world where um, we're talking about um, emerging technology, right? Um, even uh, if you go to most public institutions today, you obviously still hear about topics uh, that are probably they must have thought 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, I feel the use of big data uh, to determine curriculum in this new it is actually very, very, very important, right? Not only to the student and obviously to the government as well. You would need to be more specific and you also need to look at What's the position of the country, or what's the position of talent uh, within my within the country, so that you leverage what is the talent within the country to determine what curriculum needs to be taught, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you take, for instance, you have artificial intelligence, right? Uh, one of the basis of artificial intelligence would obviously be data analysis, right? Uh, which is actually the basics, right? Do we teach uh, the basic statistics? Do we teach the basic mathematics? within our primary and secondary school, such that once this person is done with primary or secondary school, probably is in tertiary institution, he can get exposed to probably more complex uh, kind of situation like big data analysis, like artificial intelligence, like large, large language model, et cetera. I think um, government has a big role to play, uh, especially when it comes to certain curriculums so that citizens of a country can you know, be at par with their colleagues uh, in other advanced countries, especially in Africa. So I think big data plays a big role. And in order for that to happen, the government needs to play a critical role in, number one, determining the curriculum that needs to be set, especially from the primary secondary into the tertiary institution. Obviously, uh, it doesn't even necessarily have to be within the organized uh, education system. It could have um, maybe certifications, it could have diplomas, obviously, that talks about um, how to leverage uh, this big data in our everyday lives. Shiko, the work that you do does also involve advising governments on how exactly to go about uh, making good use of data. Mm. What are some of the learnings or some of the outcomes of the support that you're giving governments so far where data is related? I think if I was to be specific to Kenya, we're beginning to see an appreciation for data mm -hmm. to guide decisions, not just at the policy level, but at the classroom level. We still have work to do, but I love that there's intent and we can always build on intent. What I'd love to see more of is the question that you asked is how, how do we take advantage of data to understand whether our curriculums are working, right. to understand how to make our policy making processes a little bit more agile, because then mm -hmm. you have real time information. So we are we're hopeful that we will soon begin to see more agile. I think our way of, of, of developing policies is like 
putting us on the back foot, especially if we want to talk about education that is equipping our children for this at the future century, mm -hmm. something about the way we formulate also needs to change. And I think data offers us a really good opportunity to use evidence to be able to make some of those changes that within government would be difficult to make without like sound, sound data. Right. Yeah. Um, look, somebody said that on the African continent, we, we do a good job of putting records together, <laughs> but we don't do a good job of making sense of that data. So we have piles and piles of data, but this data tends to hit a snag. Um, and yet there's so many decisions that can be made towards making sure that this data speaks to our real life uh, challenges. So, and I'm sure that with Save the Children, there has been certain decisions that have been made based off of the data that you have collected. What kind of decisions have been made? Um, and maybe if you could just tell us or let us in on some of them so we can learn from some of the experiences based on Save the Children's investments in data. Yeah, of course. Um, so Save the Children doesn't set up its own systems. Uh, those, they did that for far too long and that's changed. So we try and work with government systems to support them to utilize and, and, and analyze the data as they wish. And it could be around something as high frequency as attendance data, which though doesn't sound particularly big data, it is big data and it is complicated and is a really, really useful indicator. So we often say a humanitarian response where the governments are perhaps either reluctant or unable to provide those systems. We work with UN agencies uh, and the relevant stakeholders, including government, um, to set up systems that help us better understand, for example, attendance. And so you will work and that can, it can have an enormous um, implications for the type of education uh, availability. So if I take, for example, girls, if you notice the girls are missing certain days of the week, you can at a larger level better start to understand why that is. It can be the foundation for follow-up or child protection exercise uh, work, case management. Um, if you see individual children, for example, uh, missing an, a certain number of days per, per year, month or so forth for any unit, it can allow that individualized follow-up. And I think from Save the Children's perspective, what we've seen and what's so important is sometimes data can be very abstract. These systems can be very abstractive. They go one way and that data never comes back to the teacher and it never comes back to the head teacher. Or really, the head teacher, people in that space, the school management committees, PTAs, things like that, they're hugely important stakeholders in helping to support children's education, but also make sure that the you know, education is a social institution. And so it's really important that the data goes back. It doesn't just go one way. Because big data is useful for governments, but it's really, really useful for communities so that they can better understand how things are going in their education systems. Because they're well spaced, well placed to support and help. But it has to go both ways. And so that's something we've really learned. We learned the hard way at SAVE. Um, and it's something we try and do with our partners and in government and so forth as much as possible. Chinidu, um, ADARE, the Association for the Development of Education in Africa, one of the biggest projects that you're working on is basically tackling the data challenges that we have on the African continent. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when, when you see how the usage of data is being done across Africa, which would you say are some of the countries or education systems that are utilizing this data and making decisions that are well-informed based off of it, um, based on the studies and the reports that you've done? We need to, you know, recognize the fact that um, data use in decision making as a behavior um, is gradually growing, um, but we need to then entrench that as a behavioral pattern, and that is what we are trying to achieve with the Education and Skills Data Challenges, which the Mastercard Foundation is funding and is going to be presented across um, uh, 30 countries on the continent. Uh, we are going to start off with a pilot of about uh, five countries: Nigeria, Angola. Rwanda, Kenya, and I think the Gambia. There's also, I think, there's also Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire as well, who are going, who've already started engagement in terms of rolling out the projects, you know, in the coming days. But essentially, I think that we are beginning to see uh, data use in some of these countries. Uh, in a place like South Africa, uh, we are looking at resource allocation, leveraging data um, performance in Egypt. Uh, data analysis is basically guiding digital infrastructure investments in schools. 
Uh, in Kenya, like uh, Shiko mentioned initially, we are looking at using data to address the absenteeism, you know, formulating attendance rules and ensuring that we can keep track of, uh, you know, pupil participation in classes. There's even the aspect of geomapping platforms to identify children who are at risk of missing out on school to be able to address some of those things. In Rwanda, data-driven uh, systems are tracking, you know, attendance and performance, you know, and things like that. I've also mentioned the case of Ogun State in Nigeria that is digitizing the whole primary education process, you know, helping to use it as a to entrance in school. Um, and the whole journey through assessment for first, second grade until the pupil exits and has a unique identity through his academic and you know life. So these are some examples that we are seeing across certain countries. But through the project, what we want to do is to make data use um, you know, a part and parcel of school administration. Uh, education policy delivery. So um, what information do we have? How can we use it to inform, you know, the allocation of investment? How can we use it to inform, you know, our ability to deliver quality learning to pupils? I also like to mention that the focus of education policy in the past couple of years, let me say in the past four or five years since the pandemic, is the issue of resilience in the education system. Um, in 2022, we held the Diadia Triennale in Mauritius, and a key focus is how to ensure that we do not shut down schools during the next pandemic. And that was a big issue. Um, Africa's learning uh, poverty was further deepened from 87% you know, to 90%, which is basically speaking to populists at the age of 10 who cannot read or solve simple, simple mathematics by 10 years uh, uh, you know, at the age of 10. And we realized that data infrastructure, um, ICT infrastructure, is at the basis of building resilient education systems. So that even if you have the infrastructure today across your schools and no one is making use of information and data at the disposal of policymakers, um, we will still be missing the mark. So essentially, uh, and the other study I'd like to highlight is the um, ICT in education study that basically highlighted um, a serious debt in infrastructure across all the countries that we looked at. I think about 30 countries and um, speaks to some of the issues around the non-use of data. And the, re, uh, the study basically goes to conclude that if we do not, if we want to achieve inclusive education for all in Africa, ICT infrastructure and data is at the base of this. And that's what the Education Skills Data Project wants to achieve. Let us build the capacity, which is basically missing, um, of policymakers, um, of school administrators, to basically use information at their disposal to inform exactly how they deliver teaching and learning. Let us use infrastructure to understand the communities, the populations, or the populations that are need, that that need, um, what sort of needs they have, and how we can address those. Let us use data and information to basically understand exactly how to help learners learn better. And so, as we bring this conversation to a close, I wanted to find out from all of us, really, do we get the feeling that the data we are generating or the data that we are churning out is being accepted by our our decision makers, because it's one thing for us to present the data, and it's another for the recipients of this data to make or accept it and make decisions based off of it. Mm. Um, do we get the sense that this is happening? As an organization, how are we collecting data in country? Yeah. Are we aligning what we want to find out to the government priority? Because if, if, if it doesn't align with government priority as much as they would like the data, they cannot find a place to use it. Are we building relationships where we inform them, we take them along the journey and not just come into the education system, carry out our research, and then go to their offices with a nicely packaged report? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of human element around ensuring that there's uptake. I think in every country you work, and I, and I think my colleagues will agree with me, aligning to government priority is key to them being able to use your data, being able to build relationships and trust that enable them to trust what you're... I mean, we, we as Africans know that we've had the history of our governments becoming vulnerable and that being used against them. And so you have to be very conscious of the fact that we're using this data. This is the reason we want to collect this data and they're walking along the journey with you. And then, of course, break it down. Nobody, I believe, reads the reports that go in our journals. Look, you want to add something? Or was that Joshua, uh, whose voice I heard? One of the uh, issues we've always had uh, has always been parity, right? Um, do I want to prioritize digitization or do I want to prioritize other things? 
right? Um, and I think that there has to be this continuous engagement with the government to say, uh, this is the value add to the ecosystem if you decide to do this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I could remember in the early stage uh, during the pandemic where we had to, you know, um, work on creating a bundle, an education bundle that says, okay, uh, for children that are working from, uh, that are studying from home, is it possible that we can get them tabs with data, with content, and they can pay, they can spread payment for this over a period of time? And because of that time, it was priority to the government then because a lot of children were at home, right? But post-pandemic, you begin to see decline in that request because kids are now back in school. Mm-hmm. It's not a top priority for them anymore. So I think just like uh, Chico said, it's about priority and having to convince the government's uh, institutions or officials to say, okay, irrespective of whatever the situation is, we need to leverage data in not only uh, increasing education uptake in the country, but also uh, uh, helping to solve um, education exclusivity, especially in rural areas uh, in, in Africa. Right. Uh, Look, you've heard what Joshua and Shikha have said. So I want to hear your thoughts on the same. I think there's some real opportunity to learn from different. We've just spoken about education, which is totally understandable given the topic. But health, for example, health care information systems, large DHIS2 and and, and their, um, platforms such as that, in, in many ways, you, education can learn from our colleagues in health who have perhaps been using data um, and and also aligning data sets, agreeing on indicators. And governments can help, different government departments can help each other out. And education can learn from colleagues uh, in different areas, especially in health. And, and it's a real opportunity for government to pool its expertise and share that expertise across departments and so forth. And there are lots of organizations and that can support that work, but it is really the goal of government and the role of government because it's their data. It's definitely not, uh, you know, they have the, the mandate to protect that data, look after it and utilize it effectively. But there's lots to learn from different departments across government, not just from education. Great. Uh, Chinadu, very briefly, I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I think that at the back of everything that we said is the question of sustainability. And this is me speaking to the fact that most of the interventions that basically go to government agencies are sometimes short-lived. Therefore, um, establishing some kind of start and stop approach, you know, to assistance and interventions. Um, Shiko mentioned the issue of also sustainable uh, partnerships and relationship building. And that is actually also an important place where everything lies. If we want to achieve an inclusive quality education and learning, uh, we must consistently approach engagement with government from a place of support and assistance in terms of, you know, maximizing what value they have. Because I believe that the value, the solution to some of the problems we find in education already exists. Uh, What we need to do is to point people to where to look to, to be able to get the information, you know, they need. Right. Um, Using data in decision making. So I think that, you know, with this, I can just sum it up in the fact that uh, we are not short of data. We just need to channel the data in the right direction. And we need to approach the government from a point of support and making sure that they understand that, you know, it's not about us imposing data on them, but making sure we're supporting them. Capacity strengthening as well Mm -hmm. um, is is very key if if I'm going to point that out as one of the takeaways. Um, and both the government side, but also looking at the innovation side, them to be able to understand uh, how to transform data into a solution. And from the innovation side as well, I might point out one of the key takeaways for me has been the fact that um, it's important for innovators to look at data or look at real life solutions using the data provided to come up with a solution that the government can be able to consume. I think that's very key. And as we carry this conversation forward and take uh, conversations on big data forward, I believe that there are certain keywords that would all like to um, put out there and make sure that uh, those listening and watching the conversation are able to understand that we cannot work without big data because big data means something to us in our education systems. What is that one takeaway word that we'll use uh, when talking about big data? 
I think for me, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to finally look at our education systems in a holistic way so that we ensure that we're offering quality, mm -hmm. but we're also carrying everybody along. All it's right. An opportunity. It's an opportunity. Joshua? There is no big data without telco, right? Um, so I think when it comes to big data um, implementation in the continent, the mm -hmm. greatest partnership you'd actually need to seek out, especially those that are building in the uh, ed tech space, is Telco. Because Telcos will offer you three key things that no other person can offer you. It could offer you distribution. Literally, most, most education institutions in the continent today are connected, right? So it's a ladder for you to, you know, add your software solutions, your big data solutions. On top of that, it's easy to sell. Secondly, also Telco also has one of the biggest sets of big data in the continent today, right? Mm -hmm. So they can offer you KYC data. They can offer you mobile identity data, especially in rural areas and people without smartphones. They can also mm -hmm. deliver your big data solutions, you know, using SMS, using USSD, uh, that's, that is more pre Brilliant in the African continent. And also, um, we've seen a lot of innovations, especially when it comes to open API uh, in the tech sp in the telco space um, across the world today. Awesome. Uh, Chinedu? My sense is to say inclusion. And by inclusion, I mean capturing more pupils into the education net or into the education bracket. We are living with the reality of 90% of 10-year-olds unable to solve mathematics, simple mathematics, or you know, express themselves in simple English. We are mm -hmm. looking at the plight of children in remote areas, communities right. that are completely out of the grid, you know, who must be captured into the education bracket or into the education net. That is what big data will solve. That is the sort of solutions that big data will tend to deliver to a lot of countries, ensure that you know a massive amount of the population on the African continent are educated and given the right quality of education. Because it is one thing to be educated, it's another thing for them to have quality education. Thank you so much, Shinadu. Look, um, over to you now. Big data allows more people, their governments to better understand as broad a range of children as possible and users of education as possible to better understand what their needs are, how they can respond to them. So it helps move from the quality of access to an equitable approach to education. Listening to this conversation, there are so many levels of making sure that we can make big data work for us in the education ecosystem, especially in ed tech. And listening in to what Shiko said, she talked about leveraging data as an opportunity uh, to transform education. Joshua did mention or speak to the fact that there is no big data without the role of telcos and by extension infrastructure and connectivity. We also heard from Chinedu who did emphasize inclusion and how important it is that we use data to ensure that inclusion is on top of the agenda. And also Luke who did speak to moving away from gender equality and transitioning into uh, equity as well or from equality down to equity and from the community level all the way up. I believe these are certain issues or just only four of many issues that we could leverage big data on to make sure it works for us as one of the emerging technologies in EdTech. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation. And my name is Joy Doreen Vera. Do make sure to join us on our next edition where we're going to be speaking about artificial intelligence in education. Bye-bye for now. EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and is part of the MasterCard Foundation Young Africa Works Programming.